Um, I use the word government a lot or governing my life and what I mean by that is the way I run the way you run your life. What is the inward government? You know, we're either being governed or led or living by inspiration, by our spirit, or we are being driven, led by our thoughts. And the thing about thoughts are that they have been programmed. They've been programmed from culture. They've been purposefully programmed through governments, through religion. If you can control a man's thoughts, you can control a man. And so, you know, you hear there's so many good things that teach us how to rethink and how to meditate and put your mind on these things, as it says in Ephesians. But I wake up, and probably you've experienced this, your mind begins to twist and turn. And it may be good things, it may be negative things, but it's usually a list. It's a list, a check-off list. If you can do this, then you get this. It's always attached to good and evil, cause and effect. Our thought life is always attached to that unless we're being inspired from a deeper place. And so as I'm waking up and I'm just listening to my thoughts this morning and then coming above them and training myself how to come above them, not judge them, not engage, not fight them, but come above them and observe. Because my thoughts are telling me things about my life, um, but observing them without the fight, without the engagement, I can begin to govern them and just kind of let them float away, you know. The word inspire comes from the word spiritus, or spear, from the Latin word that means breath, to blow, okay. I've been thinking that lately that you have to reimagine your life. We, we talk about being born again or rebirth or becoming new. From that, then, you have to reimagine or re-image your life. And the word, the word image is a concept, a representation of an optical counterpart. I like that, an optical counterpart, an image. You know, it was clear like in Scripture when you saw that they worshipped an image. It was a, a physical thing. And even Paul later said, that's nothing. There's nothing in it. There's no life in it. But now we worship the images in our mind. It literally says, says the word to exalt. So to inspire actually means one of the translations is to exalt an image, to give life to, to breathe life in, to animate, right? So you begin to imagine this relationship and then you begin to give life to it. The life you give to it, your life, your energy that you give to that image in your mind can either begin to bring you pain or joy. Can either, you know, enhance your life or destroy your life. Literally, you have people that begin to think on, you know, a, another woman that may be married and before they know it, they're in it and their life is falling apart, their children are being destroyed. It all started in the mind, in the images of our mind, the things that we breathe on. So I wake up and my mind may be going and I get to decide to inspire the image in my mind to breathe life on it or not to breathe life on it and that's the space of neutrality that we're learning just to observe it and say no I, I, I don't even have to know where that thought came from I breathe no life on it it's of nothing like Paul said with the with the idols it's nothing and so when I say it, that it's nothing and I could quit feeding it with emotion and, and allowing it to roll through me and then roll through my body um, the, the life is gone and, you know, what I realize in my own body, like my body will start responding. You know, your body will start responding to your thoughts. And our, the thing is about our mind, you guys, is it's been programmed. Cult, it's been programmed through culture. We were born into this matrix to all of these systems and the way things work. And so then we're trained at a very young age. Our minds are trained how to think within these systems. And, you know, if we go younger still, we were first imagining, you know, we're in a fantasy world and we're flying and we're the hero and all of these things. And then our minds get trained to live in one reality. And so as we are learning to govern from a higher reality, the word truth in Aramaic, when Yeshua, Yeshua spoke it, was um, the word sharara, which meant divine reality. There's another reality going on. So, it, you know, when my husband transitioned, passed off the earth, I, was, I looked at it, and I realized there's two realities. He, we, him and I spoke about this up until the end. And so then, I, if I couldn't see the truth, if I couldn't see the divine reality, I knew all I could do was step back 
And I heard God say, in time you'll know. You know, you ask why, 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 why? And those answers don't get, you know, those questions don't get answered. And I heard just simply, in time you'll know. I, I gave the example, like Joni, my, when she was like one years old, two, one and a half years old, she could barely walk. She would go to the fence, or we have a fence and there's horses next door. And I'm following behind her, I took pictures of it. She starts climbing the fence. And she's, this little girl is climbing to the top of a, you know, five foot fence. And she, when she starts to put her leg over, she has no idea I'm behind her. I grab the back of her shirt and she looks at me. I have a picture of it. She's just like devastated that I won't let her flip over the fence at one and a half, you know, years old to see the horses. And she's devastated that she can't, you know, go experience the horses. And she doesn't understand because she's too young. And in time, she'll know. In time, you know, you'll realize why at 12 you can't drive a car. And so, you know, all I've known to do in the last few years and all I heard to do is create a grid. If you want to expand, if you want, if you're not hearing God, if, if you're not seeing truth, if you know what's out there, but you're locked down, you feel like you're like almost in a prison of your mind, you have to begin to create a grid. Everyone's talking about this word consciousness. The word consciousness is to be aware of uh, a perception or the state of being aware, the quality of being aware, the quality of being awake, okay? I picture it like a grid, like a, a bowl, like how much can you contain? There's a reason that Yeshua spoke in parables to some, and that's because that's all they could contain. That's Joni, listen, I'm just saying no right now. That's all you, don't go over the fence, that's all you can contain. Okay, but the mysteries were given to the sons. The mysteries, that, that word sons in the Jewish tradition was one that's, that's uh, maturing as a son, uh, as the builder of the family name, as one that will eventually run everything the father ran. So it's a positioning, that word. It's not a male or female, it was back then, but when you hear people use it now, it's more of a position of, of maturing. And the scripture says that the sons will know the mysteries. And so when I'm looking at something, and I mean, I can't get past it. My emotions are there. My body's responding. I can't get past it. I have to come to the conclusion that I don't have a grid to see. And so all I know to do is step back, let things just go. Let things go. Things that seem so important, decisions I have to make, it'll feel like I'm ignoring it. Because your mind... Your natural self wants to look it again and look it again and look it again. The word for mind is actually a grasping, reaching, you know, it's always weighing, balancing, you know. Um, that's the word for the mind. But we have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of God, right? We can tap into that mind. We're one. Mind isn't the brain. I mean, I'm sure you know. Mind isn't the brain. It's beyond the brain. When people say they have an out-of-body experience, where do they experience it? Where are they containing it? in their mind. It's, mind is an energy. Brain, uh, your brain is it's energy, but it's dense energy. It's matter. Mind and the brain work together. But all the time you hear people that they, the doctors declared them dead or unconscious or even brain dead and they came back. Uh, Mike Steen is one of them. And he's wonderful. And he has a whole experience of what he could hear going on in the hospital. In his mind. Okay. We, we kind of use the word spirit in, in that, but it's consciousness. So as I'm waking up and all these things are going on in my small consciousness, my subconsciousness, this, this space that's been programmed, I have to learn to let it go. And I'll just imagine them float, these thoughts floating away like a balloon. And, you know, sometimes I'm holding them down. They're so important. I have a decision to make. And I have to trust that as they go, I get into this state where I know and answers just come. I quit asking, I quit knocking, I quit pressing. I come into a state of peace where I can govern from a deeper place with the mind of Christ, with my God self, my higher self, however you want to say it. And all of a sudden, the images come that are greater than what I could comprehend. So I am re-imaging my life. Not what I think needs to happen, not what I'm pushing that needs to happen, but I come to a space and I begin to see it. That word imagine, it, it means, um, it basically means to form a mental image or concept. I had somebody ask me, do I have to meditate? Uh, well, you know, these words like meditation or contemplation, if you want to re-image your life, you do. Truthfully, your mind is always meditating on something. 
your mind is always contemplating on something. It could be dinner. It could be, you know, at, you know, the way we were raised, it was like as soon as lunch was over, so dinner is being planned. As soon as dinner's over, you know, whatever, the next thing is being planned. And so think about that. That's going on in your mind. The next thing you have to do, that's a meditation. That's a, a contemplation, okay? But I get to direct that. I don't have to let it be in control of me. And, and one of the things is, you know, in my stubbornness, very often, first it begins to affect my body. And I start feeling anxiety, or I, I have to go to the bathroom, or I don't have to go to the bathroom. Like, I had issues so much where I would stuff emotions. I would just kind of file them away, and then my body got where I couldn't go to the bathroom for days. That's personal, but th th there's a response in your body to the mind. You know that. You know, you can get inspired and get chills. You can get fearful and get chills, okay? You can have a dream and wake up angry, and it was all imaged in your mind. You can begin to make decisions out of that. And so as I'm making more and more decisions in my life, I'm, I'm going deeper in these places where I've been like, I've got this part. I, I can do this. I can do this from my, my, you know, my mind over here and then over here. Oh, God, I need you. I need that deeper space, you know. And so I've been, I've been allowing this process to go deeper where I'm seeing the areas where I've been completely controlled by my own thoughts. And I'm seeing things like... Um, I, when I go for a drive, I'll listen to music, and all it is at this point is letting things float away and just getting into this state of, like, peace where I can begin to see. From that state, I am beginning to hear and see, excuse me, patterns that have been in my life for a very long time, like guilt. I don't remember not processing life with guilt, without guilt. I didn't realize the level of it. Because I've felt guilty before. That's one thing, like a deep feeling of guilt. But as I'm letting this, um, the spirit of me go deeper and the consciousness expand and have more rule in my life, more government in my life, more governing power, um, I've realized that there's a filter, almost like a filter on this camera, that if I put a filter on there and all of a sudden I'm blue. Or it's a little hint, you know, when you're on your TV and you're adjusting it. And I realize there's been a filter of guilt on most decisions I make, and um, I'm letting that float away. I didn't see it. There's little things like that that I would see, but I, I would see if they were big. Um, but once you let those filters go, you can have pure sight, which is pure consciousness, which is pure awareness. So I wake up this morning, and I want to be more aware of truth, divine reality, more aware of God than I am of my own thoughts, more aware. And, you know, that's one thing that creation can pull you into. You can, you know, look at the stars and they know how to shine. And you look at the sun and the moon and the earth and everything's in harmony. The, the, the trees know how to grow. Flowers know how to bloom. The bees know how to do their business, you know, animals know how to be the, an animal, and it's only everything that mankind has touched or is, is what gets out of, out of order, the word chaos is out of order, you know, and it's because we start, we started re-imaging, re-imagining a world after our own kind, rather than after, you know, the harmony of all, the source, the, you know, God that created everything, and so man began to create all these worlds, to serve yourself. And so here I am in this small Sheila world and I'm seeing the levels of government that I've done with me in the center. I didn't, you know, overtly say it's to serve me, but I realize that I feel better when I do this, so I do this because I feel better. Um, I feel better when I, you know, make this decision, so I make this decision because I feel better. And as I'm releasing the I from the middle, uh, and just letting life be experienced. I'm not just after peace. I'm not just after me, you know, feeling this. But it's the wind. Just seeing the wind blow through me. Just I want to be somebody that every every turn and twist, as the breeze, the inspiration, the spirit, the breath of God, can flow through every cell of my being, and I'm aware of it, and I'm allowing it, and I'm not saying no. This is how I need to govern here and then creating a world of chaos. And I've created a lot of little worlds of chaos. <laughs> you guys, all the problems that we deal with, we created, man created it. Maybe you didn't directly, 
but a relative did and passed it on down so sweetly to you, or our culture did, or men all around us. And this is why we come to a place where we don't judge each other, because we realize we're, we've been, all been a part of this creation. If someone's angry at you and you're, you stay in the hurt, you're part of the creation of that conflict. I didn't do anything wrong, and years later it was all them, I didn't do anything wrong. That stance is part of the elute that keeps that illusion in place. That's why when Eshua came and he said, you know, who is my brother, who is my mother, even who has ever sinned against me? Like he knew that in a state of pure consciousness, being fully aware of Father, his birther, the source of all, that there was no sin, that there was no sickness. He lived in another state. He lived in truth, which was the divine reality. So when they said, hey, Lazarus is dead, he's like, guys, he's sleeping. You're in a different reality than me. He's dead. He's sleeping. All right. He used that verb, but he's dead. But then he pulled Lazarus into his reality. In his reality, there's only life. There's only love. There's only purity. There's no sin. There's no error. It's all complete. It's all whole. So I, as I begin to think with the mind of God, with my higher self, with my Christ mind, however you want to, word that, I begin to see myself in divine reality, in truth, that I have no error, I have no anxiety, I have no sickness, it doesn't exist. I am the essence of God in form, and in every cell of my being there's divinity, and it, light is shining through me. Light is healing every area of darkness that I kept hidden. You know, I, I wake up and I have these processes and I'm keeping these areas hidden. And I, I push and push to try to make myself do something while I stay hidden. And God's just been you know, dealing with me that it's time to come out of hiding, which means fully be. Fully be. And, you know, one of the things about a few months ago, yes, Darren has been transitioned for several, a couple of years, two and a half years, but I've encountered him quite a bit. He laid hands on me in February in an encounter, and he told me to fully incarnate, fully become who you are. And I'm just like, you know, we're only on this earth within a certain space and time. And I have an opportunity to fully become, fully become who I am. The divine reality of Shiva. The divine reality of you. Can you begin to start and just imagine and re-image your life until the manifestation is what you see? You are, you are experiencing what you've imaged or what's been impressed in your mind, your subconscious or your conscious mind. And by an act of your will, by a choice, you can position yourself to let things go, to move in a state of neutrality, where you can begin to see truth, divine reality. And when you see truth, you hold it as truth. You value it. We talk about worship and we go sing our songs. Guys, that's not it. It's when you value the divine reality. When you value truth above everything you see, feel, hear, taste, and touch, the world is going crazy, and you live in another space. And as you live in another space, you begin to manifest that space and have the power to pull people into your truth the same way Jesus did. So those are just some thoughts for you this morning. I absolutely love you. I believe in you. Um, more than anything else, I believe that you are here to fully become you. And as you come out of hiding, there's only beauty, there's only joy, there's only peace, there's only healing, and the earth is crying out to know you. Thank you.